This is SciBite, episode 58 for August 14th, 2012. Hi, everyone, and welcome to SciBite, Jupiter Broadcasting's weekly science podcast. Fresh every Wednesday morning over at jupiterbroadcasting.com and live Tuesday evenings over at jblive.tv. My name is Chris, and joining us every single week is our host, Heather. Hey there, Heather. Hey there, Chris. Hey, Heather. Happy science to you. Happy science. What do we got going on this week? Today, we're going to take a look at the possibilities for future Olympic technology, land speed records not at the Olympics, discoveries from Flickr, spacecraft updates, curiosity updates, and as always, take a peek back into history and up in the sky this week. Oh my goodness. Now, uh, when you say some curiosity updates, you mean we got like quite a bit of stuff on curiosity? I'm just kind of guessing. I don't know. I won't let you spoil it. There there might be a chunk. I won't twist your arm. Why don't we do our first news story? Okay, what is the first story? All right, so the Federation of Equestrial International, it's in French, and I horribly butchered that, but they have lifted a ban on cloned horses in the Olympics. Oh, wow, this is not what I expected when you said future Olympic technology. (laughs) No, like, this is... You were teasing me there. Cloning technology. Wow, so cloned horses in the Olympics. Yeah, I mean, the first... Uh, cloned horse was born in 2003. Now, there are already a couple of 100 clones. Okay. But uh, mainly used for breeding. Okay. What happens is, you know, you have uh, a lot of the, the male horses that go out are, geldling, are gelded so that they're, they're calmer and they can, mm-hmm. you know, mm-hmm. chill out on the horse races. But that kind of uh, negates their uh, procreation capabilities. Right. And that sucks when you have a really great racehorse. Yeah, so, you know, the idea is you have one horse traveling the world with goodness knows what happens, and maybe it breaks a leg, but you have sort of... A backup um, horse. You know, you know, it's literally a backup horse, yeah. Wow, wow. So it's a backup horse, or it's like, a boy, this was a great horse, let's breed it. And yeah. we'll just use this one for the breeding and this one for the racing. Yeah. Well, now they've lifted a ban so that the cloned horse can actually race. Now... It came down to the fact that clones are only 98% a copy. And it's that 2% that said, yeah, all right, we, we'll overturn the ban. Beyond really? the fact that there is, you know, it's not going to make the same horse. It's the the jockey, the training, the environment, and all those kind of things bring up into. Yeah, that was an argument I was about to raise. Is It seems like, it seems like you could have two identical physical horses, mm-hmm. but if one's just had a much uh, you know, for whatever reason, a much more productive training regimen, then isn't that going to be the better horse to race? Yeah, and all these factors came together is why they sort of lifted this ban. You know, so they're they're not the exact. You can't reproduce a horse exactly, no matter what, or, or the training schedule and the, the jockey. And, you know, so this sort of essentially lets them kind of duplicate the, the field, it's it's kind of weird because, uh, I mean, the the males they geld mostly, yeah. and um, you know the the mares can only have so many foals, you know, at any time. So they're trying to. I think they're kind of like copy pasting, and they're being like, "All right, these horses are sort of out in the world. We don't know what's going to happen. So we have this little clump of horses that sort of copies." Well, you have like, you know, really controlled horse breeding. Uh, oh, I have yeah. my family, uh, is in, there's a portion of my family that's into horses and, and a rare oh, breed wow. of horses. And they, you know, they have like, uh, they have a lot of processes that they go through to verify bloodlines and all these kinds mm. of things to try to strengthen that breed. And I wonder if maybe something like that wouldn't be applied to clones. So like you'd have clones yeah. that turned out really great and you'd have a line of clones that then would breed amongst the other clones because these were all really great clones and the, these other ones that that, that that 2% made them not so great. So we kind of, I mean, I guess what I'm trying to well, get I mean, at is how do you avoid the clones that don't turn out so great? How do you avoid like just treating them like, a piece of equipment like oh you know what this horse needs uh, a better 
kidney. So let's just go take the kidney from the bad clone. Gosh, yeah, well... It seems like you could go down that path when you start well, having these... Yeah, a lot of the science, there is, there's definitely the ability and the possibility to have that and to you know, to abuse the powers that yeah. you'd have. But perhaps, um, think of it as what you have a small uh, herd of a very, you know, rare type of horse breed. What if you sort of were able to clone that, duplicate the entire herd over here and sort of follow the same breeding patterns and you have twice the amount of horses? Mm -hmm. And eventually you might be able to have such a genetic diversity that you could sort of start intermixing it, it, in a different way. I'm surprised that like this is one of the first mainstream horse cloning stories I'm, I'm hearing because it seems like allowing horses into the Olympics is a fringe case. I'm surprised we're not hearing more about like cloning for food production and things like that. I didn't well, realize, it, I mean, I just didn't realize it was this far along, I guess. Yeah. Well, I mean, you know, they're talking about the first ones are in 2003. So it's getting far enough along that they can, you know, enough of them are at an age where they could start thinking of it mm -hmm. in the end. You know, it was only 98% the same, and there are only 300 horses that compete in the Olympics. The clones would have to be, you know, competing just as hard as non-cloned horses. So it comes together. They're not quite the same. You have all the environment, the training, the nutrition, the relationships, you know, the fact that they're going to have to compete just the same as any other horse. So it kind of came right. together, and they ended up lifting this band. It's and not like they have super strength or something. No. They're just, yeah, yeah. No. <laughs> it's still pretty fascinating. Yeah. Hmm. So we'll see how it goes and we'll see if it sometimes this these kind of rulings flip back and forth every so many years. And it may change depending on you know does cloning get better or worse or what do they do with it? Mm -hmm. And other rulings about what you can do and it's all they love it, though. I mean, like, they have a quote here from a Texas breeder who says, it literally takes the guesswork out of breeding, which is a huge part of their of risk for them. Mm -hmm. And so they look at it from, like, a product standpoint. Essentially, it's like, you know, if I invest X thousands of dollars into this horse, uh, you know, they, they say here that breeding a, a show horse could cost them as much as $380,000. And that's a huge gamble where cloning kind mm -hmm. of gives them almost a much more guaranteed result. Yeah. I mean... Some of it used, like, originally I thought, like, oh, cool, wow. And then, like, certain ideas kind of bother me or kind of freak me out about where they could lead to, like you were saying. Like you spare know, parts and things like that. Yeah, and also, you know, you're playing a certain game uh, in yeah. the universe. And, yeah, that's yeah, true. You know, where, where do we stand to be able to do that? And are we going to be able to do it just for the, the betterment of a species or can well, we do well, it because I want to, you know, copy this horse because I spent a lot of money on him and I just want the same thing again. I don't want right. to do right. the gamble and there are other people who want to do the gamble. And what kind of um, new form of selective breeding will this become? I mean, you know, yeah. we already practice that and that's, yeah. that's, that's already some, we're already kind of playing some of those roles in just very careful yeah. selective breeding but i almost yeah. wonder like uh what happens when you know sure it's 300 now yeah but what happens when it's 3000 and they're breeding or something like that yeah. I, and what happens to the to, to the genetic lines down the road you know yeah. much further down the road yeah i mean you get this you know random you may be playing the odds but occasionally there is this whoa where did that horse come from or where where did that come from and it's you know, a fluke of, of genetics that is amazing. So kind of the possibility of taking that out of the mix is is kind of an uh, and, odd and idea for me as well. How many discoveries and how many how many how many things as science evolves do we look at it and go, Wow, this can be amazing, uh, but this could also be very scary and it's just yeah. sort of the line we always end up having to walk as a society. Yeah, quite a few of these stories that are brought up, we kinda you know, you look at it one way, you know, you look at it scarily or you look at it you're like, oh, cool. And then you end up kind of seeing the gray area of. I would feel more comfortable like uh, uh, in I honestly would feel more probably more comfortable in food production because it wouldn't be like they're, you know. Carrying them on, they're not breeding, they're just, mm -hmm. you know, m almost manufacturing them for us to eat. I know that sounds brutal almost, but I almost feel like. 
that's less dangerous in the, in a sense mm-hmm. too unless of course you never know about maybe something could be in the cloned meat but you know where I'm going at it's like this is these are like living animals that you train and they become competitive and 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 they're going to eventually probably breed and with I, I don't know I don't know Heather. Yeah. it's pretty it's a lot to think about yeah i mean Ron was saying it's you kind of you end up down the path and you look back and you're going wow how did we get here whoa why did past uh, society think this was a good idea <laughs> right yeah exactly and you wonder if we're turning it seems like often we could be at one of those points that when we look back with some perspective we won't necessarily be happy with the choices we made yeah i mean the you know the whole idea of the the cloning the animals for assisting a dwindling species kind of tweaks me as a as a better possibility but you know it's interesting you know that the olympics had to come down and make this sort of a ruling mm-hmm I wonder so, what other kind of, I, I, I'm assuming if it's happening at the Olympic level, it must be happening at other levels. Oh, yeah. Right? So I mean, if it's getting to the top, I, I mean, I'm, unless I'm misunderstanding, maybe it's maybe because of its unique, uh, because of the unique price and the unique thing it's doing, maybe it's only being used at the top because of who it's accessible to. But it seems like if it, it would seem common conception might be that it would be starting a little lower in, and, and it could be happening at other well, competitive levels too. I mean, the American Quarter Horse Association and the Jockeys Club uh, both uh, do register thoroughbreds in North America, and neither of them allow clones. Oh, okay. All right. Okay. So it's kind of a, right now it's a mixed bag, I think. Okay. Hmm. Yeah, they say uh, they can get as much as a 600, or I'm sorry, a $60,000 discount on the price of a second clone of the same animal. So remember how mm-hmm. earlier I was saying it was 380000 They get it. You yeah. Know, we're talking you can take $60,000 off that price. Yeah. That's pretty so. compelling. I, I understand where they're coming from, but yeah. Oof. Well, this would be an interesting one to follow because uh, I wonder if we'll remember back in four years about the story when it comes time for the horse races. Yeah. I hope, hope you know, oh, you know, so I'll so be, be here. Oh, yeah. I'm just yeah. saying, I, I, well, yeah. we remember. Yeah. We'll be looking back and be like, hey, I remember back in episode 58. <laughs> That'll be four years down the road. That'll feel like a very, very long time ago. I was like, wow, do you even remember that? <laughs> I don't. <laughs> I, need to clone my, I need to clone myself so I have less things to remember. Oh. <laughs> Maybe I can get a, a transplant memory from time to time. All right, Heather, <laughs> well, any other thoughts on that one? No, I don't think so. All right. Well, let's take a quick pause and remind everyone that SciBite is sponsored by our viewers and listeners, not by any big corporation We listen and answer only to our viewers, and you can do that in several ways. Uh, The first two out of the gate that really are sort of like the long-term way to support us and and probably the least hassle for you is we have two browser extensions, one for the Fox and one for the Chrome. And if you go to their respective uh, stores, you can search for them or just links on the bottom of our page. And if you install those, it'll automatically tag your shopping session uh, when you're shopping at many of our many of our participating affiliates. However, before the show started, Heather and I got our little heads together and we said, what would be something really cool to recommend people should pick up using our affiliate link? Remember, Heather? And I was like, yes, I, I was do. Like, oh, there must be something. I knew there was something. And uh, Heather consulted with uh, knowledgeable sources and uh, they reminded us that Star Wars Old Republic, a game very, very close to the hearts of Heather and I. Yes. It's on sale for 15 bucks on Amazon right now. Yep, and right now there is a uh, in-game event going on, so it's a good time to kind of uh, come and check it out. Yep, you can get in, uh, you can play it for a bit, and then down the road they're also going totally free to play. But if you get the game right. now and just try it out, you get to play for free anyways for a bit. Um, and also, what you think about this, this is uh, something I do, is uh, you can buy time cards on Amazon mm-hmm. and use our affiliate link to do that. Of course, as a public service message, we should also remind folks that Guild Wars 2 coming out very soon. Two weeks. You have a little bit of time left to go pre-order that. So if you want to grab that using our affiliate link, we'll have links to both of those in the show notes. And and thank you to everyone who supports our shows because it's so awesome to be able to do these shows and and really keep the sponsorships to a minimum and uh, let you guys uh, say what goes on. So we really appreciate that. All right, then, Heather. Let's move on to the SciBite News Bite. All right, Heather. What is the first story in the News Bite? More Olympic tech for the future, future, not quite like that. This is more along the lines of what you're thinking, probably. Okay, so like competitive holograms? Well, sort of. Robots? The idea, <laughs> well, holographic obstacles, yes. Oh, okay. I'll take I'm, it. I'm serious. Okay, so like, think of back to the horses, the equestrian events. Over 100 riders are injured falling every year. Sure. You know, when a you know, multi-million dollar horse goes down, 
twisted ankle years in of the training career. out the window yeah. you're done yeah so the idea is, is maybe you have them and you have a um, line of sight infrared beam so that maybe it sees it you know and it's lit up in some way so you can see it but if you cross it nobody's going to get hurt nobody's going to fall oh yeah but it indicates it alerts the judges alerts the crowd hey there's a fault you you hit the bar you hit the invisible bar I think we now, nobody's have, fallen on their head. We should have titled this episode, I'm on a horse, because uh, this is a lot of horse <laughs> talk. <laughs> There's a lot of horse. This is probably the end of the horse talk, but. Okay. This is very, uh, this is, it seems almost obvious, actually, to be frank. When you, when you say yeah. in the diagram here, they have an infrared beam, and it seems so obvious that, like, my, I mean, my garage door can do that. If I cross the infrared yeah. beam, it, it knows. Uh, so that, that makes sense. But I, I think the key tricky part of technology here, it would still be giving some sort of visual cue to both yeah. the horse and the jockey. That That's probably the fancy part, right? Yeah. The idea, that would be the obstacle that I saw, obviously, is that, like you said, it's being able to, how do you visualize that? But I don't know. I mean, in the, the image in the story, they've got the whole thing yeah. holographized. That seems so, maybe like... Uh, yeah. Oh, that's funny. They have, but they have it labeled as the Olympics 2020. So maybe they, you know, yeah. why couldn't they just do something, you know, less like a string or something, something visual, that, and then she still use infrared? Like it seems like it doesn't have to be those wood planks. Yeah. Well, that's the idea. Is try to figure out can you can you do smoke or do something so that the the rider can see it, something enough that the horse can actually see it. I don't know how much of the jumping is actually dependent upon what the horse sees. And what they ca- what can they see? Hmm. Yeah, I don't know. Maybe maybe the horse is just trained not to even pay attention. I, don't, I mean, they they have a set course. I don't really know how the equestrian events yeah. work, honestly. Yeah. To be as a as a foreknowledge, you weren't uh, you weren't glued to the horse uh, events. No, this year I had science and and I know we had rover and events, sleep. didn't we? That and was rover events. Yeah, seriously, that was more exciting than any of the Olympics for me. Yeah, when the Curiosity rover was landing, I was like, what? Earth? What's that? <laughs> I don't know what you guys are talking about. Yeah. Yeah, although it could have gotten more play on TV. I would have liked that. Uh, yeah. That would have been nice. Um, all right. Well, uh, what other kind of high-tech gadgets? All right. For the, the long jump or the triple jump, those are really kind of imprecise and time-consuming in those sand pits. Because I've seen, like, you know, you land in the sand pit, and yeah. I'm like, yeah. Where does the marker go? Right. How do you figure out who landed where? Do they, come, they must they must measure the sand pit and like come back and look at like the landing holes in the sand. I don't I don't know. Yeah, it's like there's certain I don't know what kind of a rule rule it is, but there is a uh, um, researchers at Arizona State University have actually developed uh, pressure sensor arrays that you could put underneath the landing pit, and a whole bunch of these laid out, they could actually tell exactly where a person touched down. Oh, okay. It would go. It would go through the sand. It would kind of indicate, ding, right there. Yeah. Okay. Like the. Oh, nice. So you'd see, you know have the exact distance from that, and nobody would have to go out with with tape and be like, uh. They could just be back in the yeah. booth, and it'd probably register right there. Oh, okay. There it is. Yep. There we go. You are twenty six feet two inches. <laughs> Heather, you are two and a half feet. <laughs> Chris, you didn't make it. <laughs> you got. You got to jump. <laughs> Yeah, that, that um, was me falling forward on my head. So this next gadget you have here, yes. uh, I kind of want this. Screw the Olympics. Yeah. This is, I mean, during swimming events, this is heads up gogg- goggles. During swim- swimming events, swimmers, all they're doing is, like, they don't really see anything. Like, oh, so many other races that you can see the guy running beside you. You're like, oh, I got to go. I got to use my last little bit of energy. Right. Because you don't really, you, there's no way to really you're just, judge you're that. You're just going. Yeah. So the idea is to project some uh, project something on the goggles so that you could see. You know, maybe line it up in lanes, and you, yours is you know highlighted, and you can see where everybody else is. You'd be like, "All right, I really need to pump it right now because yeah. I am behind." Yeah. Yeah. A little extra, like when you just when you think you can't put any more in. Sometimes seeing something like that, you know. Yeah. The whole idea is being able to pace themselves, and that would give them so much a better idea about how to do that and be able to, you know, to have a better feel for that. Yeah. Yeah, totally. Okay. Well, all right. So far, I so far I want myself a pair of goggles and a holographic jumping thing. <laughs> Landing pad, I don't really think I have any use for. Yeah, I was like, whoa, I fell there. <laughs> uh, automatic goalkeepers. So these are idea is uh, like in American soccer or the rest of the world football. Um, you know, they have goal tracking. Some of the type. Sometimes these ideas is does a goal. Um, 
you know, can they see what's going on? What what exactly is going on? So the idea is maybe the ball has a chip embedded into it and when it passes through the net, mm -hmm. then it sends a signal to the ref and they can watch it within a tenth of a second. Say, you know, you're right at the clock and somebody kicks for a goal. It's really up to the ref. Did it go in in time? Did it not? And with that kind of a, an instance... Something like this in baseball would be really handy too. You know, yeah. any, any kind of sport like that where 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 the ref is kind of it's kind of up to his discretion on how he calls a few things and people sometimes quibble about it. I mean, sometimes you see some big yeah. fights, right? Because they're yeah. like, that's a PS call. You know, they start. Yeah. So this kind of stuff would be like, well, sorry, chip and computer yep. sites. This that's what it is. Yeah. It said you came in under half a second. Sorry, you. Yeah. You, sorry, guys. You came in after the buzzer. Yeah. I mean, they do this stuff because the stakes on these. I mean, you know, some oh. of the stuff almost sounds like it's over the top, but it's the stakes are for these people are life and death. Oh yeah. I mean, they are so it's so you know. I mean, so these people, their I mean, life's they goal train. kind of stuff. Yeah. Oh yeah, they train so hard, and you yeah. you know you you got a credit on. We were sitting on our couch watching right. them, and like, and so to have yeah, it, that that makes me sore just watching them do that. To have it come down to a ref's call. Yeah. I can understand why they'd want to change that. Yeah, and like, you know, the the refs might feel a little bit safer. You know, they were like wearing a mask. Hey, don't talk to me. The, you got to talk to the during, boss. Computer says it's this. Sorry. Yeah. Like, instead of having to wear a mask during the game, you're like, the whole world is watching me. Mm -hmm. There yeah. is an entire country that wants to take me out right now. That's a tough spot to be in. Yeah. Yeah. This next one also, to be honest, seems really obvious. Yeah. It's retractable diving boards. I mean, most on a good day, they say, you know, a he diver's head misses the board by a couple inches. I mean, in what in, you know, so we've seen uh, quite a few of these where a diver's head, you know, hits the, yeah. the board. The idea is for this is in the matter of a second, which is about the time that a diver is airborne before they come back through the, you know, the, the area of the board. It could retract as much as three feet. So that's I guess that's that's the tricky thing is just the speed at which it needs to do it. Yeah. Huh. Well, I mean, as long as, like, they take off, that would be the tricky thing, is to make sure you timed it so that they didn't, like, go to the jump and expect it to be there. Yeah. Oh, my gosh. Well, there, you know, there are events, that there are specific rules. You can't, you know, jump. There's hard boards, you know, and then just the bouncy boards that you can jump, jump, die. Right, right. So the ones that are just, you know, stand and go. Then you pull that back. I mean, and I suppose to have the speed, you'd have to probably have it automated, so the board would have to know what the intentions of the diver are, because you're not going to want a human there pushing a the button. Oh no! Yeah, I mean, yeah. once you get down to the the nitty gritty, you have a sensor there on the end of the board. Yeah, I mean, if you need to move something three feet in under a second, you're going mean, to need even, a computer to do that. Yeah, you know, where a sensor at the end of the board, and whenever you know they can tell that the feet have left the board for you know so much time, then they pull it back. Mm -hmm. But I mean, that kind of a thing is really a lot of safety involved. I mean, we talked about the uh, Olympic tech a few weeks ago and a lot of that was about safety. This is another thing about safety that I really kind of yeah. hope that it, hope that it goes forward and quickly, even, you know, at the Olympic level at the, you know, any type of higher level training and competitions. Nobody wants blood in the pool. No. no. And I'm pretty sure they like their heads. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Skull skulls in one piece. I I'm pro non broken head. Right. Science is pro non broken heads. <laughs> um now uh the uh the next story kind of is in the same vein of big achievements. Yes. By a living thing. Yes. Just not by man. No. I mean the <laughs> the Olympian Usain Bolt, he made the you know, world record right. nine point five eight seconds and uh, hundred meters. Incredibly impressive. Yep, and beat out by a living year old cheetah. <laughs> this cheetah went 61 miles an hour. No. Yes. And this is like standing. They open up the back of, a, of the van and they drag a little, <gasps> you know, toy across oh the, my gosh. the, you know, the yard and whoosh. 60 miles per hour. So 61 they, miles an hour. They have to have a... Uh, they have to have a toy that can retract it. Oh my gosh, the thing's so fast the camera guy couldn't keep up with it. Yeah, I know. And this, I mean, this is from the Cincinnati Zoo, and they actually have these events that go on on a fairly regular basis, where they go out and they they kind of run the cheetahs. Oh, it's probably great for them. Oh yeah, it's it's great for for them, and it you know increases their you know 
their abilities and their stamina, and it also raises a lot of money. <laughs> oh, okay. Hey, hey, it, it raises money for you know for cheetahs in the wild. Oh yeah. You know, there's there's all sorts of ideas where these corporate you know oh, these good for them. so they can get together and I mean cheetahs in the wild could probably run faster, but you know they're so uh, this cheetah went a hundred meters in five point nine nine five seconds. Five point nine five seconds. Yes. Hundred meters. Yeah, that's like three hundred feet. That's a that's a fast cat. Yes. Ah, uh, there's nothing there's nothing running away from that in the wild, right? Well, in the wild, they probably go even faster. But in the wild, you know, dinner and survival and dinner for your kids is probably on the table. Oh, it's on the line. It's so on the line. Oh, sure. Oh, yeah. No, for there. sure. I just can't think of any any prey that would be able to run from that. I mean, that's sort yeah. of like a done deal. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> not not a lot. I mean, you're like a whole far away, and you're like, oh, great. Wow. I'm wow. in trouble. It's really beautiful. I mean, that's oh. the other thing I'm really struck by is uh, you guys should go check out the video link in the show notes that Heather has a... Uh, has sort of like a behind the scenes uh, 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 day where they're where they're, they're doing this and um, interviews with people and, jeez, what yeah, a, is, what an amazing uh, what an amazing creature. Yeah, I mean, uh, it broke uh, Sarah the specific cheetah that this was broke the record like two years ago and rebroke her own record. Aww. So she's one fast cheetah. Yeah. Wow. Well, uh, it kind of makes me want to go to the zoo. See yeah, that is that is a great plug because now I'm now I'm like I that's not only not only do they probably make it as a fundraiser but that makes me want to go to the zoo right there. So yeah, now we just need an affiliate for all zoos. <laughs> <laughs> all right, well, any other thoughts on that story, Heather? No, I don't think so. Well then, it's time for the two bite news. We two bite this, news. Yeah. Two bite news. Two, two bite news. news it's time. All right, what's the first story in the two bite news segment? A new species was discovered really? on Flickr. I heard the headlines. I, I should say I read the headlines. I didn't see the details. Yeah. So what happened here? So entomologist, you know, bug scientist was, you know, randomly flipping through some images, posting on a database. Checking out bugs. <laughs> yep. Saw this unknown species of lacewing. It's a tiny little bug. And he saw this and he's like, Wait a minute. Wait a minute. It looks like Wait, it has a spider on its wings. No, it's just, it's. I know, but that's what well, it looks like. It looks like yeah, a spider. Yeah, it kind of does. It almost looks like, uh, yeah, you know how sometimes they have natural defenses to kind of look spooky? It's scary looking. Yeah, yeah it's a little spooky. He definitely is. So he saw that and he's like, okay. So he contacted the person who took the image and they had, they were, you know, catch and release. He took the picture and it flew away. Now, in order to actually, you know, label it as a new you know, species, they had to go out and he had to collect a specimen hmm. and then he could officially write up the discovery. But it was discovered on Flickr because somebody took a picture and posted it there. Wow. You know, <clears throat> you know, we talk a lot about finding, uh, finding the data within the data. Yeah. And, and really, in a lot of ways, you got to figure there's other things out there sort of like, uh, sort of like, um, uh, sort of this. I just read a headline today uh, that uh, it looks like potentially. I don't know if I don't, did you see this? That it looks like they might have uh, discovered a new set of pyramids by using Google Earth. Oh, really? Yeah. Uh, so sort of the same story. Uh, a group of geologists were, or a guy, a geologist, mm -hmm. or, was looking uh, at uh, Google images of uh, of some uh, spot at uh, the demon. Uh, the, I can't pronounce it in in the middle of Egypt. Anyways. Mm -hmm. Uh, they think they found some deteriorated pyramids and now they're going to go check it out. Oh, wow. So kind of another one of those, you know, examples of finding the data within the data. Yeah. Well, I mean, the back when we started getting satellites, we saw, you know, we looked out and we're like, oh, look at the craters on the moon. Mm. Oh, well, look at the craters everywhere. Huh. You know, there's not a lot of craters here on Earth. I mean, at first they didn't realize that meteor crater in Arizona was actually, you know, a meteor because... Everyone said, meteors don't land here on Earth. Oh, that's interesting. What are you thinking? That's interesting. They're like, was yeah. it like a, a fallen in volcano or whatever? And, you know, there were a couple of people who said, no, it, it is actually a meteor. And there was the problem that they couldn't find any big rock because it actually disintegrated into a whole bunch of little ones. Yeah. But once they had satellites, they're able to look down and go, huh, Well, circular spot, circular spot, circular lake. Right. It's a whole new they're, perspective. Yeah. I mean, the, 
you know, the weather wears these things down. So it was from, you know, the satellite detected from the orbit that they're able to look down and be able to see these things. Yeah. You know, so you're able to to go up and, like you said, you're able to find these things in very distant, remote locations that, you know, you're not really going around and, you know, I think it's chilling a, in the desert too much. It might not be an apt comparison, but you know how a couple of weeks ago we were talking about, or maybe it was maybe it was maybe a couple of months ago, we were talking about how humans are sort of naturally really good pattern recognition machines? Yes. It, it's like by putting all of this stuff on Flickr and putting all of these things on Google Maps, we're sort of, uh, we're sort of letting a thousand or a million monkeys pattern recognize things. And even uh-huh. if it's, you know, at this very little uh, churn rate, it's still discoveries that just because the data, which we've had, is now becoming more accessible. I mean, think about it. The images they're putting up on Google Maps are images in a lot of cases we've already had. It just wasn't available to general people. Mm-hmm. Or the stuff on Flickr, there's probably people been taking pictures of stuff that hasn't been discovered forever, right? But they've just been on their own personal collections in, their, in, a, in a, some sort of shoebox in their closet. Yeah. But now it's yeah, online. I'm- yeah, I mean, you know, maybe that person thinks, oh, cool bug. Or, you know, maybe somebody takes yeah. a picture of, you know, the the stars and they think nef- nothing of it. And I'm like, oh, my gosh, that is this satellite or coming in. And, you know, you see something that nobody else really realizes in the background or. Right. So mu- there's so much stuff there that you're right is be able to to cross. Everyone crosses information and yeah. be like, hey, and look make at it that. more making it more available. Yeah. Hey, you know my proximity sensor here is flashing. Should I smack Uh-oh. this? Let me see. Go ahead. Oh. oh, that's the spacecraft update alarm. That's what that is. All right. What's our first spacecraft update? Slowly but surely, inch by inch. Voyager one is heading out to the edge of the solar system. We keep talking. Now it gets closer and it's closer. Yeah. yeah. They haven't labeled it as out yet. Okay. But uh, in a single day, the it measured a 5% jump in this level of higher energetic cosmic rays, the same as it took for over the full week in May. Mm. So two of the three sensors that are required to say, all right, these three things really need to change for it to be considered out of the solar system. Two of them jumped way off the scale. You know, they were really close to being, you know, official, but the third one wasn't. The problem is like a few days later, everything was kind of back to normal. Hmm. So, hmm. you know, maybe there's some eddy currents going on. But right. Just an indication, though, that it's getting very close to the edge, but not there yet. Yeah. But if it's likely if that's starting to jump, then it's getting close. Yeah. It seems like every few months we get better indications of it's getting closer. <laughs> it's getting closer. It. Oh, man. How exciting. Yeah. Warmer. Warmer. So one of these warmer. weeks, one of these weeks, I'll sound that uh, spacecraft update alarm and you'll come on here and tell me that they have declared it, won't you? Right. Yes, yes, that 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 might be right at the top of the show. We're like, oh my gosh, we have something outside the solar system. <laughs> oh Found the spacecraft update alarm right now. Right now. All right, now uh, while uh, Voyager One may be near the edge of our solar system, some other it things, was having a good day. Yeah, you know, some other things were not having a good day. Not getting so far. No, the Morpheus Project, um, sort of low budget engineering project. These are the kind of things where they say. We're going to take stuff more off the shelf, um, you know, sort of make it, you know, make it in-house. Hmm. Do it kind of on the cheap so they can get about 80% of the way there without costing all the money. So you can kind of hammer out a couple of the smaller details. And this poor guy is why. He had a really bad day. He, you know, it's one of these things where it's um, go up, sort of like the, you know, the hover you know, supposed to go up almost like the jetpack from Curiosity. And they'd done a whole bunch of these tethered flights, you know, and everything was fine. Everything was fine. Yeah. And then it wasn't. And it went up for a few seconds and then it tipped over and it crashed into the ground. Yeah. Started catching on fire a little while later, blew up, had. So it didn't have a good day, but no. they're already going through and investigating the cause. And because this type of, because it's, of the more <laughs> they just watched the thing really blow up yeah oh go gosh. far and boom it's kind of really apparent <laughs> now uh, i gotta tell you the one story i read about this like immediately started busting out like it's a 1.6 million dollar project does that oh, sound right whole, to you? see that's what i thought like the whole thing that. yeah but the way that the article was written is it made it sound like this cost them 1.6 million dollars which yeah, i thought well, was very dis- it felt very disingenuous when i read that well and so many of these projects 
it's hard to say, oh my gosh, because there's a lot of man hours in that. Yeah, that's for sure. Man hours, man hours cost a lot in these hour projects. They're, but this is this is how you build these things is by testing and destroying them. I mean, this yeah. is this is part of the building and creation process. Yeah, I mean, even if it was say you know a million dollars, <laughs> if they did it, it, just you know whatever. Yeah, I mean, this is like the cheap version off the shelf. Right, if they'd done it like all fancy. Right, it could be yeah, it could be three hundred million. Yeah, okay, yeah. 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 So it, it's so much more. So the kind of idea is work out the the basic bugs on you know in a smaller system right and then say all right we we've, we've hammered out a whole bunch of the silly obvious stuff or the not so obvious and obvious after the fact stuff now we can you know spend the money and get the the space rated stuff that seems like a practical approach to me heather very practical yeah. i'm glad to hear i'm you know i'm glad they're not blowing a ton of money doing that stuff yeah all right well what do you say uh we go to mars you ready let's go and lift off of the atlas five with curiosity I could listen to that over and over again. Uh, Alpha one of curiosity soundbite awesomeness. Yes, yeah. If anybody, uh, if anybody wants to create us a curiosity rover soundbite jingle, we can play for updates. Please email it to scibite at jupiterbroadcasting dot com. You yeah. never know, Heather. We might get lucky. Somebody might make us something awesome. Yeah, I know. <laughs> I can hope, because otherwise I got to oh. do it, and that was yeah, my first attempt, and it was uh, not so good. Yeah, my first attempt didn't like actually translate over the internet to be able to herd. The tubes are hard. The tubes are hard. Yeah, they didn't like me. And you know, we but, think we have a tough time, but Curiosity has to transmit from the surface of freaking Mars, so we really can't complain. does. So, last time it was landed and everything was exciting, they've gone back and they're able to see you know, the kind of accuracy. They're actually able to get it... Um, they landed about one and a half miles away from where they were targeting. Oh, okay. Okay. I mean, they shot this from Earth. Yeah. <laughs> and they kind of adjusted once or twice. It was like, oh, mile and a half. No, wait. That's like, That's pretty you know, good. try to drive straight from California and end up close to where you're, really close to where you're supposed to be on the East Coast. Right. And get you're landed like, by a rocket. Yeah. You're like, huh. That's pretty I'm good. That's pretty in good. Florida and I was aiming for New York. Uh, I heard that they did like an OS upgrade over the weekend. That's a pretty, they, gotta, that's got to be pretty nerve wracking. Yeah. So, you know, it was going to take four days to do it. They just finished it today. Everything checked mm. out fine. And everyone was like, why did they do that? Well, it was because like the first batch of their, their OS was all about landing. It was traveling through, you know, the entry descent landing. That was, you know, that took up the entire, yeah, you know, computer. So now they've, dumped that and they've been able to put on the type of stuff that's required to to drive to sort of wow. safety check the driving to do the instrumentation the scientific equipment that is now, that is not the answer i expected i thought you were going to say they i'm sure this might be sort of it, but i thought you were just going to say yeah they had the test units back here you know they continued to test the software and debug it during transit and then they had a bunch of fixes that would improve it that they wanted to upload well of course there's going to be in debugs but no they've they've made it specifically so that they'll have this one and possibly this is the major, you know, update. There might be one or two others that they go back and they say, All right, we need to be able to do this kind of stuff. We're gonna put a whole new OS on this thing. And it was like you said, it was quite nerve wracking. They had to update the primary computer, the backup computer, and it's not like you can go over and cycle the power. <laughs> no. Yeah. Hit the you reset know. button for me. Yeah, next time you have to do a software update, and you're like, man, this thing is annoying. Just think you're like shipping it to Mars. Huh. Well, and, and just, you know, uh, you got to really make sure you're doing your checksums because I'm sure transmitting through space, your operating system is a little more prone to uh, maybe uh, a bad bit. Yeah. And, you know, it's it's not like the entire project is riding on your shoulders when you hit, you know, start, upload. Right. Wow. You know, no, nothing like that. I, I didn't even think of the fact that the computer resources required just to handle the landing and all of that would consume everything the thing is capable of. I just assumed it. Could do everything. Well, yeah. it makes sense to me because you could put in all sorts of contingencies to make sure that entry descent and landing goes fine. And then once you're down on the surface, you don't need any of that anymore. Yeah, no, it's never going to use that again. <laughs> never, ever again. So might as well put, you know, all the extra software because it does. It has, we're talking about this uh, last time. 
how it has the hazard detector camera. So it will be able to tell like, oh, wait, nope. Earth thinks I should drive forward and I really know I shouldn't. Yeah. So there's you know, all that processing going on there and they're right. able to install that now. So, and of course there's a whole bunch of pictures weren't, which, you know, aren't that great for a audio show, but there's also information to go with those. They will, you know, they've got the location. Oh yeah. And actually it's, it's, it's really weird. The, some of the first images, um, you know, the first, you know, hazard cam things came up and in the corner of one, um, you could actually see this uh, this blob. Yeah, the cloud, you know, the kind of blurry the spot. Yeah. And initially people went, oh, oh, oh. And then somebody went, wait a minute. Could that be like the sky crane crashing? Everyone went, nah, of course not. And then they started going through. They started analyzing. All right, this is the exact position that the, that the lander is in. This is where it's facing. This is where we see the sky crane crashed. Yes, they actually were able to catch the sky crane crashing. Wow. And it, and it blew up, you know, all the, the dust. And shy of, you know, somebody standing there and being like, yep, that happened. All indications are that, yes, that is exactly what happened. The, the exact moment hit and, the, you know, one, one in a million kajillion that, So that chance. was not intentional. No, it was totally not intentional. Because, you know, they had that amazing shot uh, from um, the uh, reconnaissance uh, orbiter that... Uh, uh, yeah, they... That you was know, yeah, that they, was intentional, but that was, oh, that, was that was also, but that was like a, that was an amazing shot, you know that. Oh. Uh, and so I thought, yeah, I thought maybe maybe they did that. No, this again. was this was not intentional. It was just sort of a a random, you know, one picture to the next. They're like, huh? No, that 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 couldn't be that. And then they looked back and they're like, no, all the, you know, they measured north is this way. It was 115 degrees, and they kind of measured off. This is where the camera was. This is where the sky crane is, and it lined up. Within like twelve degrees or so, and it would have been exactly in the, the in the range of the camera. Wow, boy, talk about talk about just doing it like the most awesome. That's just a that is just an amazing landing. Oh, so incredible! So it's still like not everything's turned on yet, right? Like it hasn't taken no. like the with the best camera yet, or is is that right? No, they've actually been able to raise the mast cam. Okay, so that is so now they've been on. able to take okay. some of those. Okay. and uh, you noted some uh, some stuff in the. You know, they're in the notes bringing it up about how did you how do they do color images? Mm -hmm. You know, in the past it's been you know filters and combining them. This is actually a color image, just like a cell phone or a camcorder would record. A uh, oh okay oh okay. So it's, it's it's specifically a color camera. So they have uh, it, and it's only like a six megapixel camera too, or something like that. It's not crazy, yeah. right? It's, it is no, it's not crazy at all. But it's taking the same manner that. You know, you, you hold up your camera and click. It, it's the same kind of technology. And it has these, like some of these pictures have like these, uh, um, these they're not censored spots. They're just the the, the no. thing doing the panorama it didn't line up right. So those plots are blanked out. Yeah. Well, so many of these panoramas are actually a whole bunch of smaller shots right. stitched together. Right. So maybe those shots just weren't taken yet. You know, of the of the rover, then yeah, there's a possibility that that's probability that that is not being able to translate well. Because you're looking straight down and mm -hmm. everything's skewed very, pretty badly. Mm -hmm. but some of the farther stuff out, maybe they just had, you know, they didn't have areas that were, you know, taken with that uh, specific, you know, resolution. So, okay. So if the main camera's on, so is there anything yep. else that they're still not yet turning on as they? They haven't started driving yet. We talked okay. uh, last week and uh, the science brain failed because I was saying one to two months. It was actually one to two weeks. Okay. One to two weeks. Okay. Yeah, so in the next week and a half or so, they they plan to actually start, you know, the wheels moving. They're going to check out the steering actuators uh, the 13th Mars day, and then they'll actually drive forward a couple meters, turn, hmm. and then come back. And that that's their first goal, to drive forward, turn, and come back. Just to, just to make sure the stuff's doing what it's supposed to do. Yep, they're going to they're gonna check that out. They're going to continue, you know, checking each instrument out. Uh, some of the color images, you'll see um, some of them, the, the exact same image look different. Mm. Like one looks, you know, brighter or whiter. Mm -hmm. What that is, is they call it white balancing. And what's happening is they have the picture on Mars. And that is through the Martian atmosphere, through the dust. What they can do is they can sort of reverse filter it and say, all right, if those rocks were on Earth, <laughs> this is what they would look like. Huh. And it helps... Uh, geologists and scientists 
just look at something and be like, oh, yeah, that I recognize that. Because it's, you know, you recognize things on Earth, how yeah, they look yeah, here. Yeah. And, you know, through, you know, the Martian atmosphere and the dirt and the, the dust in the air, it's going to look different. Yeah. So maybe it might take you a little bit longer to identify and be like, yeah, that's it. But it's really made up of the same stuff. And it, it oh, really yeah. is. Yeah. I, I got you. Oh, yeah, it's all hmm. the same stuff. It's just being able to sort of. So what I'm not following translate. is, <clears throat> are the rocks actually a different color and they're just changing them to, to, to help with scientists brains or are they making them the correct color uh, that they, that they actually would look if I was standing on Mars and, and looking at it? No, it's the, the images that they show are if you were standing there and you saw it. Okay. Now, what they're doing is, say you're, you're standing on Mars, yeah. and we magically take a chunk of the dirt and the soil and you and teleport it to Earth. Right. And, you know, you're, you're sitting there, you're still standing on the Martian soil, uh, but now the dust is cleared in the air, and, you know, the light is shining through Earth's atmosphere and everything. And it's, it'd, be, it'd be more our color because of the blue, yes. because of the blue sky. And, yeah, oh. it's the, the rocks are the same color. Yeah. You know, everything is the same. It's just... Plus, Mars has that red sun. No. Oh. <laughs> no. No. Oh, I'm sorry, Heather. I'm sorry. It's okay. It's okay. Science will someday forgive you. <laughs> well, I'm pretty... Oh. Any any other uh, any other key points from the week of curiosity? No, pretty there's... Exciting. Yeah, I mean, every week they're going to do, do mm. updates and there's going to be a whole bunch of stuff that's interesting, especially right here at the start. I'll probably come back and be like, hey, they've oh, yeah. got this instrument going. Hey, they've got that mm. instrument going. Well, in one of these Pretty weeks you'll be like, all right, it took its first drive, right? Yep. So, yep. It, it's, it's doing its driver's license. It's It's got his learner's permit. Now, uh, so when they go out, when it goes out and does this little turn, is that all going to be within a very tight time period or is it like, is that like a multi-week process in itself? No, that won't be a multi-week. That'll probably... Less than a week, probably okay. a couple of days. So we might actually, you might actually, by the time we have, by the time it happens, it might have already done the whole thing. Yeah, possibly. Okay. I uh, mean, generally there's, <clears throat> they'll only drive so far. They might only drive a meter or two a day because mm-hmm. they don't want to go, they don't want to miscalculate too much. They kind of take it a little, the driving slow, but sure. If this is Star Trek, they kick that reactor into high gear and they go full, they go just like Picard on a, on a desert planet. <laughs> um, well, that, that's only if we were there to dune buggy it. Right. <laughs> That's for the future. Once we make it, once we get there and it still has a little power left in that reactor, then we can have a little fun. Yeah. <laughs> All right, if, they, if they let us near that, then we'll do a side bite from the moon buggy. Oh, yeah. Here we go. We'll be bouncing around. Oh, yeah. Time. Oh, yeah. We could do that. I can rig that up. Totally. Totally. Uh, any other thoughts? <laughs> no, just... Lots of pictures and stuff to check out in the show notes and uh, oh, yeah. looking forward to all the fun stuff that's coming up on sh- uh, oh, yeah. Curiosity. All right, then. Well, then jump in the time machine. Here we okay. go. Close the door. Close. Right. It's close. Oh, oh, oh. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I almost pushed the wrong lever and we almost went to the future. I tell you what, you know. uh, that's a good thing, too, because our destination takes us to 125 years ago, August 19th, 1887. Yes. Dimitri... Ivanovich Mendeleev. Oh, good. Pretty sure I sort of said that name right. I think that's pretty good. I liked that. Yeah, he used a balloon. He ascended above the cloud cover to an altitude of 11,500 feet to observe an eclipse in Russia. It, it, it's kind of funny. Everyone was kind of concerned because he was totally ignoring, you know, controlling the balloon, and he didn't really know how to work it. He didn't know how to land it. What? But he, he, no. This, this guy really like, wanted to see an eclipse. Yeah, it was like total cloud cover, so he wanted to get above it. So he, he went up, and he's like, woo! And then he's like, oh, yeah, I got to land. I suppose I'd be good. Did, did he make it? Yeah, he made it. Uh, and he didn't played. blind himself or anything like that either. No, he, he, he didn't look straight at the sun That's to good. do that. He didn't look through. Well, I just he, thought, you he, know, he if he didn't think about that. landing the balloon, then he might not have thought about pl- not blinding no, himself either. No, he's a sort of <laughs> absent-minded professor. Gosh, you know, talk about like, getting carried. I I, I love have my it. telescope. I have all my stuff ready. And I'm like, yay. And then it's like 20 below. I'm like, cold. 1887. Oh, yeah. 1887. Yes. Good times. Good times. Well, I love it. All right. So that's what happened this week in science. Now, let's take a look up in the sky and see what's going to happen this week. That's right. This last week, you may have seen the uh, Perseid meteor shower. There's probably pictures starting to pop up mm. uh, now about people who were able to actually take pictures. It got up to about 100 uh, meteors an hour, which is pretty good. Yeah. So we had that going for us. That's not bad. Did you get to see anything? Uh, no. 
Not yeah, quite. I saw pictures. Yeah. I had, I had, it was really warm and I had clouds. Yeah. I had, I had clouds and. God, know, I am getting screwed by clouds. All these cool things that I, I know. Am, uh, well, the internet is happy. There was actually a, uh, I tweeted it. There was actually a, NASA had a camera facing up and they're like, here, watch live on the internet. Oh, NASA. You had a huge dream. That's so sweet. great. So I clicked over that and I was able to kind of watch. It wasn't that great of a camera, but it was kind of fun to sit there and watch. That, boy, if that doesn't sum up 2012, uh, I was able to w- live stream from NASA a meteor shower, but the camera kind of sucked. That is so. Yeah, you know. <laughs> that, is, that is so 2012. First world problems. <laughs> exactly. All right. Well, what else? Uh, this upcoming week on Wednesday, we're around twilight. If you look to the west, you're going to see uh, Spica, Mars, and Saturn again. If you missed it uh, last week, Spica, the star, is at the highest point. Saturn is to the right, and Mars is nearest the horizon. And if you see Mars, wave to Curiosity. Aww. Yeah. Say hi. Uh, hi, Curiosity. <laughs> you go on to uh, Thursday, you know, at the right at dawn, you're going to start seeing the constellation Orion, which pretty much is one of the more observable, you know, obvious people can recognize, recognizable yeah. uh, constellations there is. Yeah. It's going to be to the right of Venus. So Venus is going to be there at dawn. Uh, we get, move into Friday, early morning. You're going to see Mars, Saturn, and Spica again. Dang. So you have another chance to see them. And that'll be New Moon on Friday. And then uh, kind of on the whole this week, about dawn, you're going to be able to see uh, Venus and Jupiter ah. in the east just before dawn. So if you're up you're early. unfortunate enough to wake up that, about that time, check say out hi to Jupiter. Don't, yep, don't burn your eyeballs, but say hi to Venus and Jupiter. Yeah, definitely. Because, you know, mm-hmm. Jupiter... We gotta love Jupiter. Yeah. Gotta give love to Jupiter. Well, all right. Yeah. Well, the Heather. Yeah. Jeez, I think I think that's the whole show right there. I, I think, think that's the all the science. Um, now, of course, if you would like to enjoy the science live with us and uh, participate in our chat room, and thank you to the live chat room for joining us this week. Join us at Tuesday at seven thirty p.m. Uh, Pacific, and that's at jblive.tv. And of course, you can then get all of the links and the uh, downloads available over JupiterBroadcasting.com on. Wednesday mornings. And uh, Heather, thanks for a great yeah. show. Thanks you. All right, everyone, and thank you for tuning in this week's episode of SciBite. We'll see you right back here next week. <laughs>